Well, good morning. Good to see you here this morning. Would you please open up your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We are in a series called The Kingdom. It is a series simply working our way through the book of Matthew. And uh, we have several little mini-series that are involved in this big series, The Kingdom. And and so it all comes uh, in uh, the sequence that the Bible gives us. Uh, we've just finished a series uh, that uh, Jesus had us in as he was teaching this, uh, this Sermon on the Mount, as we know it, uh, in Matthew that goes all the way from chapter 5 up to chapter 7. And uh, now we come to this section that begins at uh, chapter 6, and we want to look at righteousness and religion. And what those two things mean together, righteousness and religion. That's where Jesus has us as he teaches this Sermon on the Mount message. Remember that as he's teaching this message, this is a message that is um, all about kingdom principles. He's introduced to us the fact that there is a new kingdom. The kingdom of God has arrived. He's the king. He's here. There's a new kingdom. And what that does is it causes division. Because now there are two kingdoms. We have the kingdom of the world that most people uh, are in and everyone starts in. And a few people who put their trust in Christ are born again into His kingdom. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Those two terms are used uh, interchangeably. And so there's a, a, a division and people are in one kingdom or the other. As you think about that, uh, it's important to understand that uh, religion is a heart issue. The kingdom is a heart issue. We have the idea that, very often anyway, and I think this was the idea in the first century as well, the idea that anything religious is good. So if you're doing something, some kind of religious activity, well, it just has to be good because it's religious activity. And so I I chose the title of this particular message uh, as carefully as I knew how and called it, as you can see, When Giving is Evil. That might just sort of surprise you. How could giving be evil? How could that be an evil thing? And that's the whole point here. Um, Are we believing that any religious activity that we do is simply pleasing to God because it's some kind of religious activity? Did I do God a favor showing him up this morning, uh, showing up this morning? Is that uh, just a good thing because it's a religious thing? I read a great story this week. uh, A carpenter by the name of six, uh, by the name of Herman Russell died in 1994, and he left a will. And it was a really extravagant plan for the distribution of his wealth. He left uh, more than $2 billion to the city of East St. Louis, another billion and a half to the state of Illinois, two and a half billion to the national forest system, and to top it all off, he left $6 trillion to the government to help pay off the national debt. Only problem is that uh, when he died, he, his sole possession was a 1983 Oldsmobile. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it, his giving was a little empty. Uh, it looked great at first, made him look like a great guy, and then there wasn't anything at all to back it up. I've been reading uh, the Old Testament again recently, and I'm always jolted as I read through the Old Testament at all of the religious regulations. Everything has to be done exactly right. It's amazing. Now Jesus comes and in the Sermon on the Mount he flips that on its head and he's been teaching that the law was always a heart issue. 
And religion needs to come from the heart. But when he teaches that, he does not abolish the law. And so when you put that together, what you have is the fact that now religion that's done from the heart has to be done right. Religious activity is expected, but motive is everything. Motive is everything. So as you consider that, uh, look at Jesus' words with me, if you would please. Matthew chapter 6 and verses 1 through 4. Matthew 6, 1 through 4, Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Now notice that when Jesus came into the world, He confronted the two major problems that existed. What are they? Sin and religion. It was assumed, though, that the two were separate. Well, here's sin and here's religion, and those two never intersect. They don't have anything to do with one another. But here Jesus says, not only do they intersect, but they're colliding at a, an amazing rate, and they're both interweaved within one another, and religion is purely sin at this point. You remember back in uh, chapter 5 and verse 20, the springboard for all of this teaching that Jesus is giving in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, verse 20, unless your righteousness, you who come to faith in Jesus Christ, you who will form the kingdom of God, you who will be born again, uh, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't even enter the kingdom. So now he talks about religion, but here's the thing. Just like the law that he has talked about, Jesus does not abolish religious practice. He requires that his followers learn a completely new and different way of thinking and doing religion, but he doesn't abolish religion. You remember he said, you dare not put new wine into old wineskins or they burst. Well, what's the interpretation of that? The interpretation is the new covenant in Christ cannot be put into the old legalistic works-focused religion of the scribes and Pharisees. It cannot. We, we can't begin to practice, watch now, as so many are doing in our culture and in religion today, in the church today, we cannot begin to practice it the way the scribes and Pharisees did because that's not going to cut it with Jesus. And so Jesus teaches a very radical, really, approach to religious practice and the promise in this, you notice two times in the text, the promise in this is that only if you practice it the way that Jesus says to practice it, will you be rewarded by God in heaven. It's exclusive. It's not, well, this is my idea, this is his idea, and that's her idea, and it's all good. Jesus is very clearly saying in these four verses, not all religion is good. Yes? So I want you to notice this morning uh, three things that we must understand about the practice of religion. 
three things. The first one is, is this. Motive makes the practice of religion either righteous or sinful. It's motive that makes the practice of religion either righteous, that is, right with God, or sinful. Look with me again, if you would please, at verse 1 and see what Jesus says about this in the introduction to what he's saying here. He says at verse 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you'll have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Again, that's an introduction. Jesus warns that many who practice religion are never going to see heaven. Right? The Jews to whom Jesus is speaking right now uh, are extremely religious people. Their, uh, their teachers, the scribes and the Pharisees, put an emphasis on external righteousness, that is, rightness with God, an external rightness with God. You know, look the part, you'll be okay. Uh, external righteousness. Do these things, and God will love you. <laughs> and, and Jesus says that that external righteousness really gets you nowhere with God. It gets you nowhere with God. And Jesus is about to bring up in the text as we go forward from here, he's about to bring up three areas of religious practice uh, in which it has been assumed by the current teachers that you can do no wrong. In other words, here's the three like biggest things in religion that religious people do and the scribes and the Pharisees believe, look, do these things and you'll be right with God. And Jesus says, no, I can show you in all of those religious activities. And he's, he's going to give us these. Look at verse 2. Giving is one of those religious activities. Verse 5. Keep going in chapter 6. Verse 5. Prayer is one of those religious activities. In verse 16, fasting is one of those religious activities. You can do any one of those religious activities and really any other religious activity, those are the three highlights. But you can do any one of them and it can be pure sin in the eyes of God. Pure sin. And that's why Jesus opens up his talk, you'll notice with the chapter 6, verse 1, with what word? Beware. <laughs> Beware. Take heed. You can do this wrong. Pay attention to this, he says. So here's the question, what is it that determines whether a religious practice is righteous or utterly sinful to God? What is it? And he says right there in verse 1, when it is in order to be seen by others, then it becomes displeasing to God, it becomes sinful. When it is to be seen by others. That phrase there in our English Bible, in order to be seen by others, is one word in the original language, the Greek language, and, and it emphasizes the fact of a premeditated thought. Uh, the idea there is that uh, somebody has really thought about what they're going to do to impress other people. They've given it some consideration. In other words, uh, this is doing religious things with intentional premeditated desire for people to see you, to approve of you, to love you, to appreciate you, to applaud you. Maybe, let, let me just tack this on because I think it would be helpful. By way of just personal experience, maybe it's, uh, it's a pastor. Well, if I just make sure that he sees me doing and saying the right thing, then I'm good. It's the whole, excuse my language, when I'm in front of you. Or, or maybe it's uh, rivalry with other people. That's a church thing, right? <laughs> uh, what did she wear on Easter? It's to be seen. by I'm here to be seen. Or maybe it's family. Because family loves to pat you on the back when you do the right thing. Maybe it's a religious family. Maybe there's expectations. Whatever it is, there's all sorts of directions that this comes from, isn't there? Right? What this uh, all involves is motive. 
And that's what we need to think about. In order to be seen by them means motive is a heart's desire. It's about your heart. It's about why you do what you do. It's the driving force. And you take that into consideration now, along with me, and what you recognize is that just because something is religious in nature, it doesn't guarantee that it's acceptable to God, does it? In fact, if you just use Jesus' three examples, uh, prayer, fasting, giving, it might be an offense to God the way we do it. So any religious practice really can be an offense to God in the way that we do it. It can be utterly sinful. It can be evil in the way that we do it. God is not nearly as interested in the fact that you do religious things as why you do religious things. story goes, uh, the statistics go, really, that when Russia fell to the communists, church attendance changed dramatically. It's an interesting thing because it was one of those moments in history where things changed overnight. See, there was one day where going to church was the acceptable social norm. It was expected because the Russian people wanted to be like Americans. And hey, Americans go to church. At least back then they did. And so the communists take over and the next day it's suspicious if you go to church so it goes from socially acceptable to suspicious in one day and would you guess at what that did to church attendance 80 percent drop 80 eight zero in one week from one week to the next so it begs the question, right? Uh, why were they going to church in the first place? Why were they attending in the first place? What was their motive? Had to be people, not God. And that's why when you practice your religious acts to be seen, Jesus says there again in verse 1, then you'll have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. No reward means no reward. You can expect nothing from God when your heart's desire is to please people. If the reason that I participate has anything at all to do with what people think, I can expect nothing whatsoever from God. Let me give you an abstract illustration of that. In 1936, the, the Queen Mary was the largest ship to ever be launched. Enormous ship that was put out on the ocean. And it went through World War II and three decades of service, and then it was retired, and it was retired and made into a luxury hotel, a floating hotel and museum. And when they made it into the, the, the hotel, they took those huge stacks off the top, those three big stacks, and they wanted to redo those stacks, so they put them on the dock. And do you know what happened when they put them on the dock? These were made out of three-quarter inch steel plates. And when they put them on the dock, they disintegrated. There wasn't anything left of those stacks except 30 coats of paint on the outside. No metal. So, Jesus says many religious activities will be shown for what they really are in the end. They will, they'll, they'll just crumble before God because there was nothing but a few coats of exterior paint causing them to work and making them look good. 
That's it. Jesus says, you'll have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So motive makes religion either righteous or sinful. Secondly, motives are identified by the way in which we practice religion. Motives are identified by the way in which we practice religion. As we talked about already, motives are inner heart issues. Amen? Heart's desires. And the toughest thing about them is that they are invisible, generally, to the people who are struggling with them. Did you, did you hear what I said? That's, that's really key. When, when I have false motives, it's the hardest thing for me to see those false motives. I need the help of other people. Generally, the one who claims that their motives are pure and they don't need any help is the one who is protecting themselves. The Bible tells us what? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? What's the first line there? The heart is deceitful. Somebody say deceitful. Deceitful. What does that mean? It means that it's, it's tricky. It's deceptive. It means it fakes you out. It means it's duplicitous in its motives. It, it means that it's always misleading you if it can. Motives are rarely discovered. And so what Jesus does here is he begins to give us some identifiers. His followers, real, genuine, born-again believers, will want to know what their motives are. We're not going to bury things. We're not going to hide things. We're not going to live in that kind of deception. We're going to want to know. And so Jesus gives these um, identifiers for us. And the first one is giving. Giving is an identifier. Look at verse 2 there and notice he says, Thus when you give to the needy. Thus when you give. The Jews took uh, giving to the poor very seriously. In every community of the Jews, there was somebody that was in charge of going around and getting the collections. Uh, you, you didn't uh, just go to the synagogue or just go to the temple and give. They came to your door. <laughs> uh, in, in fact, if you lived, if a man lived in a, a village for 30 days, he was responsible to begin to give toward the soup kitchen. And if he lived there for three months, he was responsible to begin to give to the, what they called the poor box. I tell you all that to tell you that in the Old Testament, giving in the kingdom of God, that is among the Jewish people, giving was tax. Do you understand what I'm telling you? It was a, a tax. So the tithe was a tax. In fact, uh, you think about tithe as 10% because that's what the word actually means, but the tax was about 23 to 28%. That's what the Old Testament tax was in the kingdom. Now I want to introduce a thought to you, and that thought is this. Um, it's not that much different in the kingdom of God now, in the new kingdom, in the new covenant. It's required. Now somebody's just going to be bothered in their seat like crazy by what I just said. You'll get an itch that you can't stand about now. But that's the truth. Uh, open your Bible to 2 Corinthians with me. Of course, you're going to want to keep your finger in Matthew 6. But if you'll open to 2 Corinthians, let me show you what I'm talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, if you would, please. Now I'm going to give you an example here from 2 Corinthians 9, and then I'm going to show you that that is the standard, not the exception. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, look at just verse 7, if you would, please. Very simple verse, 
2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So let me just show you three things out of that text. Very simple. Pull them out one at a time very quickly. Notice the words must give. Is that, is that what it says? Must give. Each one does what? Gives. Those of us who are born again give. And then I want you to notice, yes, it is a heart issue. Now here's where some people who are not born again begin to back up. Oh, well, it's from the heart, so I've decided not to. But they missed the must. The heart issue is how much am I going to give? How generous will I be? Not how much will I withhold, but how generous will I be? Must give, it's a heart issue. And then thirdly, the requirement is what? Cheerfully. I want to give. My desire is to give. My hope is to give. I want to make more so I can give more. I've heard that from people. Giving is what people do who follow Jesus. That's what it says. Now, that's been that way from the beginning. Jesus gave us that example. So Jesus, the king, comes. He establishes the kingdom. And guess what he does in his ministry? John chapter 11, Jesus gives to the needy. And apparently it was his practice because that's what that verse says. It was an expectation from his disciples. Oh, it must be time to give to the needy. Jesus gave. Jesus gave, and so guess what? The body of Christ gives. The church gives. The first church gave to the poor and provided for widows. It's in the text of the book of Acts. And so it's been ever since. All of that comes from a heart that wants to give. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So there's a heart in giving. God gives, God gives us his heart, we give. Freely you have received, so what? Freely give. And so we as children have a heart that says we want to give. We're givers. Now, no wonder when you go back to Matthew 6, in our text, Matthew 6 and verse 2, look at the way he talks about it. Matthew 6, verse 2. Thus, when you give, not if, but what? When. Somebody say when. When you give. So there's just an expectation, not even an instruction, it's just how we are that we're going to give. Now I have to tell you that no sooner did the kingdom begin <laughs> that the motives began to be an issue. And so Jesus now gives tests of our motive. Let me give you those in sequence from verse 2. First of all, uh, notice the evidence of a sinful motive. The evidence of a sinful motive from verse 2. Here's what he says, Sound no trumpet before you. That's the evidence of a sinful motive when you're sounding a trumpet before you. There's no indication historically that anybody was blowing a trumpet when they were giving. It's a figure of speech. But you know it, like I know it, it's a figure of speech that is a 21st century figure of speech also that was taken from the Bible, and probably very few people know that. But to toot your own horn is what? Right? Yeah, it's to trumpet. The Pharisees had rigged things in the first century uh, at the temple and at the synagogue so that everyone would know how generous they were. They, uh, they put the giving box at the front of the church and they had everyone pass by there 
and put their giving in in, in front of everyone. And, and that's why you see verses like uh, the famous story of the widow's mite where everyone is observing what the rich put into the box. But I want to help you a little bit with that. I want to help us a little bit with that. And, and I want us to think about the fact that it's not always a public display that causes this issue because it's a motive thing. It's a heart thing. And, and so it's really uh, all about what I'm doing in my heart with this. So if you turn over to Luke chapter 18, you get a great example of the internal issue. Luke chapter 18 Look there at verse 9, if you would please. Luke 18 and verse 9. Jesus says, uh, or it says here, excuse me, as an introduction, He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were, what? Righteous. Yeah, here's the issue. Right with God and treated others with contempt. Verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And here he goes, watch. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. Just stop right there. That's the only example we need. Just the first one. He was tooting his own horn, Amen. But here's what's interesting. It says that he was standing off by himself when he was tooting his own horn. So who was he tooting his horn to? One, to God, but I don't think he really believed God was hearing him. I think he was tooting his horn to himself. I think he was talking to himself. And I say that because I think that's common as fur on a cat. I think we talk to ourselves about how great we are pretty often. And I think that's what the Pharisee was doing. And here, here's what the Bible says at Psalm 36, verse 2. Just listen to this and, and, and consider the flattery, self-flattery involved. Psalm 36, verse 2. For he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. So here's a person who's talking to themselves about how good they are, about how great they are, and they can't pay any attention to the sin in their life because, hey, they're so fantastic. And, and here's the point, I think. We butter ourselves up in one little area where we're doing really well, and we forget about everything else because, boy, in that one little area, I'm doing great and I don't want to think about the other. Now let me apply that for you for a minute in, in terms of giving. For giving, uh, many people, giving is their claim to salvation. Giving is their claim to salvation. Whatever they lack in, let's say, evangelism or knowledge or fellowship, they imagine their giving makes up for You know this because you see it in the headlines all the time. The, the rich and the famous want to be known for their giving so that the rest of their lives can be kept in the dark. Now we nod our heads, but I think this is a church issue. Because uh, the problem here is that what we cannot see is that the uh, self-flattery exempts us from any other reward. So you, you notice here, now watch, this is, there's a certain kind of greed that places giving above every other virtue. And thus it places the giver on this self-made pedestal. I've put myself here because my giving is so great that I don't have to worry about all the other commands of Scripture. I don't have to worry about the fact that he said, go and make disciples. I don't have to worry about this. I don't have to worry about that. I ignore everything that the Bible says otherwise because I am a giver. Giver. 
Psalm 23, Jesus announces a woe to the Pharisees because they tithed on everything, but he says they should have been paying attention to the weightier matters. Like what? People. People. So notice here, the evidence of a sinful motive is tooting your own horn. Followers of Jesus will sound no trumpet. Secondly, notice the examples of sinful of a sinful motive. The examples of a sinful motive. Going back to Matthew 6 and verse 2. As the hypocrites do, Jesus says, in the synagogues and in the streets. So what Jesus does here is what he often does. He uses the Pharisees as a handy and picturesque example of sinful motives in giving. He says, just, just look at the hypocrites. You'll understand what I'm talking about. Our righteousness must exceed theirs, so look to them for that bad example. He calls them hypocrites here, and he does it about 30 other times in the four Gospels. That was kind of his pet word for the, the Pharisees, is hypocrite. Now that's a key word in the Gospels, and it explains Jesus' condemnation of those religious leaders. They created a man-made system. They were hypocrites. That word hypocrite, understand, it's one who appears to be one thing, but actually on the inside is another. That's, that's a hypocrite. So you see Jesus using examples of this. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Hypocrites. Outwardly clean cups. In other words, he, he says that the Pharisees were in Psalm 20, or excuse me, uh, Matthew 23, he says the, the Pharisees were like a cup that's washed on the outside, but it's got disgusting stains on the inside. <coughs> Hypocrites. And then he says that they're like whitewashed tombs. This is the best one. Because th they have dead men's bones on the inside. They're responsible for the death of many, and they themselves are also dead on the inside, but boy, do they look nice and polished on the outside. Hypocrites. Now, here's an interesting fact. The word hypocrite in the original Greek language is a word that was used in the theater primarily of one who wore a mask to perform. That's where it comes from. So you see that the Pharisees were hypocrites in their giving because they wore a mask of uh, religious generosity, but behind that mask was a, a motive of doing what? Gaining for themselves a reputation. It was about what they would get. And they wanted to be glorified in the synagogues and in the streets, they wanted to be glorified everywhere, is what Jesus is saying. I think it would be helpful to us to uh, turn over to John chapter 12 for a moment. John chapter 12, you're going to find an uh, example of a hypocrite. that I think is really very helpful to us. Not a Pharisee, but a hypocrite in his motives in giving. That example is going to be the example of uh, Judas. So if you look at uh, John chapter 12, John 12, the Gospel of John chapter 12, um, you see here Judas wearing the mask of a disciple. But that's not who he really is, right? Right? John 12, look at uh, verses 1 to 8. Just let me read through this quickly. Follow along. Somebody say, I will. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. <clears throat> so they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Well, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, which caught 
Judas' attention. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and had charge of the money bag, and he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. Stop there a moment and recognize that uh, maybe your first thought as you read that is, why didn't Jesus confront him on his thievery? That seems to be the issue, but what Jesus did instead was go to the heart of the matter, the motive was the issue that Jesus went to. He goes much deeper, always does. Religion is not a surface issue, it's a heart issue. That's where he goes. And notice here now, the problem with Judas' heart was that money was more valuable to him than Jesus. Somebody is here and is extravagantly showing love for Jesus... And the only thing Judas can think about is how much this is costing. What's the price tag? Let's see if it's worth it. But Jesus, uh, Judas, excuse me, Judas made sure to express it in a way that sounded like he really cared about poor people, didn't he? Hypocrite. Remember, it's for 30 pieces of silver that he sold Jesus down the river. Money was valuable. Even when Jesus spoke to the motive of his heart, he didn't repent. He didn't fall on his knees. He didn't say, I see my issue. He kept with it and sold himself out. We read in 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Jesus says what? He says of his followers, they will not be hypocrites. Their insides will match their outside actions. So we have, so far, we have the evidence of sinful motive. We have the examples of sinful motives, the hypocrites. And then thirdly, notice the expectation of a sinful motive. The expectation. Go back with me again, if you would, please, Matthew 6. Why do this? Why do all of this? The expectation of a sinful motive is found at verse 2 again. That they may be praised by others. They're expecting to be praised by others. That's why they do this. They give with the expectation of a return from others some sort of attention, some sort of benefit. It's why they do what they do. Now, I think it's important to understand that the Pharisees were consumed with the idea of praise from people. But I also think it's important for us to get a hold of the fact that many of us are. Many of us live for the praise of people, some kind of recognition. The Pharisees lived for that, and I... I, I say that with authority because the Word of God says that. If you consider Matthew 23, let, let me just read this to you. Matthew 23, 5 through 7, Jesus says, They do all their deeds to be seen by others. Did you hear that? They do all their deeds to be seen by others. Everything they do. Now, now listen to the list. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. So all their deeds. Think about this now. The expectation of praise is, is from everywhere. First of all, the clothing that they wear, is, is they wear it so that they might be praised and accepted by their peers. That's what he says. And then where they sit. In other words, they position themselves. They make sure to be in the places that they, they know that they might receive praise, so they, they make sure to plant themselves there. And, and, and then what about greetings? Well, greetings, just, just a hello or the shalom 
In, in, the, in the old uh, Jewish, you know, in the old Hebrew, shalom didn't just mean peace to them. To them, whenever they heard shalom coming their way, it meant, boy, I'm important. Somebody's saying hello to me. Their hearts were so messed up with the desire for praise that everything meant something else. And notice the titles. You know, being called rabbi. Being known for something. Some identity that causes you to feel like you're accepted. All their deeds. Giving was just another means of obtaining praise from others. And by the way, very important to understand that Jesus cited this uh, expectation of praise as the very reason that they could not be saved. See how important that is? It, that's what he said at John 5 and verse 44, my favorite verse. It's right up here on my uh, podium that I read every time I walk up to this podium. John 5, 44. It's the reason that the Pharisees couldn't be saved. It's the challenge to our motives. It, it, it says this, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? So as long as your primary concern is the approval of others or the acceptance of others, it's probably going to be impossible for you to come to saving faith in Christ. You're never going to be able to put the value on Christ. And the worst thing is that people followed that example. You, you remember Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. The only reason they gave was why? Because they saw other people giving and they got attention from that. That was so dangerous to the first church that they died for that so that the church would have fear of God instead of desire for attention in themselves. The lure of praise from people is a very strong drug. It's a very strong drug. It causes otherwise sane people to act insane. If your expectation is praise from others, your religious practices may be sinful. So what do we have so far? We have evidence of sinful motive, tooting your own horn. We have examples of a sinful motive, that is the hypocrites. We have the expectation, that is uh, praise from others. And then finally we have the eventuality of a sinful motive. The eventuality of a sinful motive. Again, looking at Matthew 6 and verse 2. Jesus finishes verse 2 with this statement, Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. They have received their reward. When they stick to that sinful motive of people-pleasing, of attention-grabbing, whatever it is, there is nothing more to look forward to. That's what he says. Nothing more to look forward to. L look at that statement there at Matthew 6 and, and verse 2. They have received their reward. That's packed. Somebody say packed. Um, their reward. You see those words? Their reward. It, it's, this is in contrast to verse 4 where he talks about the reward of the Father. So your reward either comes from you or it comes from God. And these people have manufactured their own reward. It's their reward. They receive according to what they've done. They reap what they sow. It's their reward. They made it, they get it. That's all they get. A and then I want you to notice their reward and also the present reward. No notice there it says at verse 2, they have received they have received. You see that? They have received. So there's nothing more coming. They've received it all. It's past tense. Those accolades, that vainglory, the praise from people, it, it, it's all they're going to get. They've received everything. It's all done. So when you do it for the praise of people, when you do it to get somebody's approval, it, it's whatever it is you get, you got it. That's it. It's done. That's all there is. Then you have to face the music. Face the music. 
By the way, you know where that uh, phrase comes from? Face the music. <laughs> there was a fellow in the early 1900s who wanted to join the Imperial Symphony Orchestra. But he couldn't play a note. But he wanted to look like he was really a musician. And he had a lot of money. So he went to the conductor and he paid the conductor to be able to sit on the front row with a flute in his hand. Why a guy chooses a flute, I don't know. I probably just, just insulted somebody, I'm sure. But here, listen, <coughs> that's not the point. But here, he, so, so he pays him so that he can sit there and look like he can play the music. Problem is, a couple of years later, after receiving all kinds of accolades for being in this famous orchestra, another conductor comes and is hired. And the new conductor decided what needs to happen with the orchestra is that everyone needs to audition again and let's see if they're good enough to be in the orchestra. And so he gets to this fellow who's sweating bullets and he's supposed to audition. He says, I'm sick today, can't come in and do it. And over and over there's excuses and finally the conductor says, no, you are going to have to come in and you're going to have to audition or I'm just scratching you off from the roster. So he comes in, can't play a note, and the conductor says, I guess you've faced the music. That's where the term comes from. That was the day he had to face the music. He had received the only reward that he would ever get, and then he had to face the music. Here's what Hebrews 4 and verse 13 says, No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now, in case you wonder, because uh, all it says here is that they did not receive or could not expect to receive any reward from God, in case you wonder what it was that the Pharisees had to face, Jesus has a final word on that, Matthew 23, again. Jesus said in Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 33, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you going to escape being sentenced to hell? They had to face the music, amen? The eventuality of a sinful motive is that you'll have to face the music. So we have... Uh, Motives are identified by the way in which you carry out religion. Motive makes religion either righteous or sinful. And lastly, once identified, motives in religion can be righteous. Once identified, motives in religion can be righteous. That is, right with God. Okay, we've worked our way through chapter uh, um, 6 and and these verses, but look at verse 3, if you would, please. Verse 3, But when you give to the needy, Jesus says, do not let your hand, uh, your left hand, know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Here he's saying that Christ's followers will give religiously and righteously. What a contrast these two verses are to what we've seen so far. Amen? What a contrast. People of the kingdom of God, people who are born again, will give religiously and righteously. First of all, notice this as we work through this. Um, the method of giving will be righteous. The method of giving will be righteous. I take this from verse 3. Rather than trumpeting their giving, believers will do what? They won't let their left hand know what their right hand is doing. Rather than tooting their own horn, they won't even speak to themselves with applause, will they? This is a way of saying don't even praise yourself. Avoid any thought of how good you're doing with this. Wanting your name on a plaque is not the way the born-again believer operates. So the method of giving will be righteous. You won't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Secondly, the mode of giving will be righteous. The mode of giving will be righteous. Look at verse 4, if you would please, again. Rather than making sure that others see and praise us, 
real true uh, born-again believers will give in such a way so that your giving may be in secret. Your giving may be in secret. So all the giving that we do, we make it private, we make it quiet, we make it secret. Now again, I want to remind you that it is what? It's a heart issue. Are you staying with me? It's a heart issue. So this is not a situation where you have to say, uh, look, Pastor Lynn, why are we passing the plate? People get to see that I put an offering in there. No, this is a heart issue. This is about what you're thinking about that. This is about what your heart says about that. If it's all about the fact that, oh, wait till people see what I do, that's a problem. That's a problem. It's a heart issue. The mode of giving must be righteous so that your giving is in secret, it's quiet. It's about you and God. So we have the method, we have the mode that is righteous, and then thirdly, the motive in giving is righteous. The motive in giving is righteous. Again, looking at verse 4, rather than being hypocrites who make sure everyone sees our giving, true believers do what? They know that the Father sees in secret and will reward you. The Father sees in secret and will reward you. Uh, Notice there, first of all, that God sees. Are you seeing that? God sees. We we need to understand that God is omniscient, that God does see. The Bible says that uh, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind and give to every man according to his ways. God looks internally at us. He sees what's going on in the heart. Doesn't do you any good to fool anybody. God sees. That's the point there. God sees. Now, notice here that when your heart is righteous, when it's right before Him, He will do what? Reward you. I love this because what He's saying is this. When we take the least notice of our good deeds, God takes the most notice of our good deeds. Boy, this is an exciting crowd. You're just on fire, aren't you? Woo! Woo! All right, so what are some, uh, some righteous motives in giving? I want to leave you with three righteous motives in giving. Righteous motives in religious giving. First of all, faith is a righteous motive. Faith is a righteous motive in giving. If you notice that last phrase, your father who sees in secret will reward you, that is a phrase filled with faith. (laughs) In order to really trust that you have a father in heaven, you have to have faith. In order to believe that God sees, you have to have faith. In order to believe that there's a, a reward coming and you don't need one now, you have to have faith. It's a faith filled statement. It's a faith-filled statement. It takes faith to invest in the unseen. It takes faith. You know, um, we put out the need for our Thanksgiving Day meal. We said we needed $750 to pay for that meal. And I found it interesting. No, I found it motivating. I found it exciting that a great deal of the money toward Thanksgiving was given by a man who works two jobs and both of them are minimum wage. I wasn't supposed to know that. He just needed to know how to get the money to the right place. Faith. Faith. So a righteous motive in giving is faith. Secondly, a right motive in giving is love. Love. Your Father who sees in secret will will reward you. Those who follow Christ love people. Those who follow Christ love people. Back there at Matthew 5, uh, if, if you're close to it, you can look. Back there at Matthew 5 and verse 46, 
What does Jesus teach us just before this? For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't evil people do that, he says? But Christ followers love as the Father loves. We give, that's proof of God's love in us. So when the Corinthian church gave, the Bible says they first gave themselves to the Lord, and that's exactly the the process that you and I need to have. I give myself completely to Christ. My heart is changed. My desire to give is righteous. I love this quote by Amy Carmichael. It might be helpful to you. It says, uh, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Righteous motives. Faith, love, lastly, glorify God. Lastly, glorify God. A right motive, certainly, in giving is to glorify God. The willingness to give grows out of a desire to see God glorified. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31 says, Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Do it for the glory of God. By the way, uh, it's important for you to understand that while it is absolutely sinful for you to give for the purpose of being seen, it is not always sinful to be seen giving. Uh, If you look again at Matthew 5, for just a moment, I want you to see something very important. If you are seen giving for the right reason, the right reason in your heart, it's a good thing. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and do what? Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The motive makes being seen either righteous or utterly sinful. And so as we finish, what do we need to do? Well, God's Word teaches us to humble ourselves under His mighty hand that in due time He might lift us up. So what do we do? Glorify God. Glorify God. Glorify God. And listen to me. One day, He will glorify you. That's why we call heaven glory. Because you will be glorified there. Not like Him, but you will be uh, entirely sanctified. Completely sanctified. You will be glorified. So wait on Him. Wait on Him. Have His heart. Be righteous and religious in your giving. Father God, thank You for the opportunity, Lord, to be in your word today. And as we just pause right now, Lord, uh, just pause this prayer. Father, we recognize, God, that Jesus died for the sins of believers. He was raised again the third day. There may be some here this morning who do not know You, Father. They have not put their trust in Christ. They have not repented of their sins and come to put all trust in Christ to save them. Father, we ask today that Your Spirit would work in such a way that some would turn from sin and turn to Christ. Lord God, uh, thank You that You give us Your heart and that we can walk with You and learn to be righteous in our religion. Father, we pray that You would cause us, cause us to be righteous in all of our religious acts, in everything that we do. And we do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.